When it comes to finances and taxes, having a big bill at tax time is the worst. Worse yet is if that bill comes as a surprise to you because your CPA, investment professional, or financial planner uh, were not on the same page. Today, we shed light on the biggest culprits causing nasty surprises at tax time. Whether it's capital gains distributions, high interest rates, or underwithholding on your income, we cover it all coming up today on Retire Smarter. It's another edition of Retire Smarter. I'm Walter Storholt here alongside Tyler Emmerich, Wealth Advisor, Certified Financial Planner at True Wealth Design. Tyler is also a Chartered Financial Analyst and the resource that we turn to each and every episode for guidance and advice through this financial landscape. And I am quite interested in today's episode, Tyler, because I have been in this category where I've received a nice big surprise tax bill. Used to do a lot of 1099 work back in the day. And uh, yeah, it was tough to manage as a young gun working a lot of 1099 jobs and, and trying to f- navigate these waters. So this, this, this rings true to me this week. Fair enough. Did you head into April going, uh uh-oh, uh-oh, wonder how big it's going to be this time? (laughs) Oh, yes, yes, very much so, my friend. And, um, you know, I'm sure people have had much more than I have, but uh, we have had a a five-digit bill pop up before in April, so... You know, yes, that's, that's, uh, that's not, not insignificant. <laughs> no, not at all. Well, and, and, and being a 1099, um, I mean, you're all on your own there, right? Um, for sure. But uh, you'd be surprised sometimes uh, the W-2 employees, it comes around and for whatever reason, the withholding uh, is messed up or maybe you get some portfolio income or whatever the case may be. And boom, before you know it, uh, you get that you get that surprise come tax time, which uh, which is never fun. So as I think about today and kind of the podcast and what we're going to be covering, I figured it'd be a good time to dive into uh, some of those major culprits that um, are behind some of those surprises. So that way we can come into tax time being a little bit prepared. I mean, we're in mid-March here. So uh, our small business owners, a lot of them are either on extension or have the business returns done. And then we're vast approaching that April 15th deadline. So it'll be here before you know it. And, um, you know, as you're kind of getting those returns or as listeners are getting the returns complete, if you find yourself in that camp, you got a little bit of a bill. Well, hey, maybe today uh, on the podcast, we'll dive into you know something that affected you and how you might be able to prepare for it uh, for the upcoming year. I kid you not. Uh, I'm looking at my calendar today. And later mm-hmm. today, there's a big entry with about four hours blocked off. And in all caps, it says, do taxes with several exclamation points after it. So <laughs> <laughs> the, yes. the time is upon us. Absolutely. It is. It's here. And, um, you know, of course, a, a, as you think about you know, what affects that return and whether you're withholding or your tax bill uh, is impacted, um, you know, a lot of times it does come from your actual underlying investments in your portfolio. Um, so as I think about those um, first things to touch on here today, um, you know, the first thing that kind of comes into mind is uh, has everything to do with your portfolio and is really a a byproduct of the higher interest rate environment that we're in, you know, over 2023 and really even maybe reaching back into 2022. I mean, it was a big deal for a lot of families to reevaluate their banking relationship, reevaluate, you know, where they were holding their cash because, well, we've seen a spike in interest rates. Um, I think uh, the average interest rate on a high yield savings account now is approaching 5%. You know, Walt, it was uh, 0.22% back in May of 2009 and literally was depressed for almost a decade. So um, a little different. Uh, yeah, to that, say the that least. has definitely changed over the last decade plus. It has. And you know, just you back into the math a little bit on that. You know, if you had $100,000 sitting in a, a high yield savings account earning around 5%, that's $5,000 of interest that is going to flow through and come down on the good old tax return and be taxable to you. So if someone just in a marginal tax rate at 24%, you know, that increases their tax bill over a thousand bucks uh, from a federal standpoint. That's pretty you know, sneaky. So that a lot up. of people aren't going to be kind of keeping that in mind, I wouldn't think. It is, right? I mean, you know, especially considering you know, earlier on and for over a decade, really, we weren't seeing a whole lot of that interest because um, it was so low. So we weren't seeing a lot of it through, through, flow through on the returns. You know, 2022, it picked up a little bit. And certainly here in 2023, you know, I'm sure there's going to be a more than a handful of conversations uh, about, well, hey, um, I didn't think this interest was taxable or I didn't know how it was going to actually flow through on on the return. I was sitting with a family 
literally just a, a week ago. Um, and, you know, they were very happy because they, they got their return done. So they were ahead of the game, Walt. Um, theirs that were finished up and, and they said, hey, our, our taxes, we ended up owing around 6000 bucks. And so we dove into the return a little bit, and these higher interest rates um, were really the culprit. Um, you know, they ended up having quite a bit of interest. Uh, they used a number of CDs, and they were individuals that really just keep a lot in cash. A lot of times this is a personal preference and something that we want to monitor. And this was one of my first conversations with them, kind of diving into well, how much they normally kept in cash. And, you know, from their standpoint, they're going and saying, hey, you know, we're getting a decent interest rate on this right now, but you know, after we consider the amount of taxes that we had to pay on that interest, you know, those four and five percent interest rates look closer to three percent or maybe even a little lower uh, after you account for that tax bill uh, that you got to pay on them. It's interesting when you look at all the different ways that these uh, these little tax hits can come at you, a lot, a lot of different angles and, and ones that you didn't necessarily think about. I, I know I was conditioned, you mentioned the one about the, the interest rate increase. I graduated in '09 from college, and so I was conditioned all those early working years to not be thinking about, um, you know, the interest that's being created in savings accounts and those kinds of things. That was that was a nothing burger, not, not a concern. <laughs> and now all of a sudden, yeah. that's kind of something to keep in the back of your mind. Absolutely. Well, and you think about it just from an overall portfolio construction standpoint, you know, that couple that I was meeting with, and when we got down to it, it it really is driving their decision on, well, what is the right size and the right amount to maintain in their cash positions, and really kind of approaching it from uh, the tax, a tax lens and not just uh, an investment lens. Um, You know, diving down into these higher interest rates a little bit too, um, you know, the Fed comes out this week, and I think they're going to give a little more guidance on uh, what they're expecting interest rates to do for the remainder of 2024. You know, it seems like, um, you know, we're expecting rates to kind of maintain the level that they're at and maybe start to decrease towards the end of the year here. Um, so you, if that does come to fruition and the government and the Fed is, um, is right, um, you know, you're going to start to see the interest uh, rate on those savings accounts and those money market accounts uh, start to decline uh, over the latter half of 2024 as interest rates, uh, you know, go down. And, you know, we look at our job as financial advisors, um, all the time we're meeting with investment companies and trying to get a lay of the land. And I think one of the most common slides on those slide decks when we're getting those presentations are around like where interest rates are right now, uh, where they might be heading and, you know, should families be maintaining the amount in cash and their savings accounts and money market accounts that, that they do right now. Um, one of the best charts that I had seen was kind of taking a look back over the last 30 years or so and taking an inventory of, well, when did rates peak? And if you kind of look at that, there was a handful of times where interest rates um, had had peaked. You know, really, we've got to go back to, I'd say, about the mid-2000s to you know find a time where interest rates were about at the same level as where they are now. You know, and before that, we'd really have to go back into the late and mid-90s. Um, so really there hasn't been, at least in more recent history here, a time period where interest rates have have been that high. So what this slide did is it takes an inventory and says, okay, well, how good of an investment was a CD? Let's compare it to some other alternatives, whether it be treasuries or a couple different bond indexes and say, all right, if you would have invested in a one-year CD at the peak of where interest rates were, and then you look at your two-year return, you know, how does the CD kind of stack up? up uh, compared to some of these other alternatives. And really, there was only one time period over the handful that they analyzed going back to the mid 80s, where uh, that one year CD rate uh, actually provided more wealth and came out ahead of the other three options. And again, those other three options being treasuries and Bloomberg bond indexes, which are you know the U.S. aggregate bond index and the corporate bond index. So just one time uh, and a handful going back to the mid '80s, where those CDs proved to um, you know be uh, better performers uh, over that time period. Which you know you kind of you know peel back the onion on that a little bit. It sort of makes sense. Uh, you know you kind of look at CDs. You know, the only thing that you're getting there is the interest rate. Uh, when you look at a treasury or a bond investment, you're getting two types of return. You're getting interest, but then you're also getting 
getting the price appreciation from those bond investments as well. You know, a fancy term for that is, uh, you know, maybe adding what we call duration risk or credit exposure, you know, to increase your returns a little bit. So, um, you know, we don't want to forget about um, those CDs and how much we're keeping in cash. And I don't want to say we want to be fooled, but we want to keep it that perspective in line when we say, and we go to the bank and they're like, hey, we got this one year CD is paying 5%. What do you think? You know, we don't want to lose sight of the other investment options that we have available to us. And we certainly don't want to lose sight of the tax impact that that interest is going to kind of flow through on the return. You know, I go back to that family that I met with within the last week and they had that big tax bill. You know, they're looking to retire. And if they maintain the large cash position that they have and getting the interest rates that they are, you know, you, they're looking at getting maybe fifteen to twenty thousand dollars of interest on their return each year. Well, when they turn the corner and retire, they're gonna. Uh, we were looking through and exploring some healthcare um, options for them, and um, those healthcare options, especially the individual healthcare plans uh, on the ACA, which Walt, I know we've talked about you know a multitude of times on the podcast here. What you pay for those plans is directly tied to the amount of income that hits on your tax return. So having these CDs, you know, kicking off that fifteen to twenty thousand dollars of of interest on an annual basis and that being taxable, you know, that would directly impact and probably increase for their case it increased their healthcare premiums that we were estimating, you know, by a couple thousand dollars more per year too. So there can be other, I don't know, I'll call it in their case a double whammy uh, on the interest that they're getting, but there's the tax consideration, but also there is the healthcare consideration for their situation once they do retire and go on an individual health care plan. Well, as you lean into all of this, Tyler, I'm kind of reminded of a struggle I had in the early days as well, was trying to figure out kind of that difference between how perhaps regular income and then capital gains were handled, especially when you then considered like short term and long term. And that's where Mm -hmm. it starts to get complex for a lot of people, or again, where it just becomes hard to calculate just how much you should be withholding, which I would imagine is part of the problem that leads to these surprises that people get. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you look at a money market position that's paying you interest on a you know, monthly basis. You know, that's ordinary income. You didn't hold that investment for over a year, and that's taxed at your ordinary income rates. Um, so what that means is, is the more income that you have, whether it be by working or pulling money out of your retirement accounts or whatever the case may be, you know, that means that you could be paying more and more in taxes. You know, in the scenario that we ran through here, I just assumed it was a marginal rate of 24%. But, you know, in the case of the family that I met with um, before, I mean, they're going to be paying almost 32% um, on those interest payments uh, because their ordinary income is quite high um, and they're in those higher tax brackets. So for those high income earners, you know, you start looking at that cash management and the interest hit, you know, it's ordinary income versus, you know, hey, you have an investment in ETF or a stock or whatever the case may be, you know, you hold those investments for over a year and then you sell them, those are considered capital gains and they're taxed that you know, traditionally would be a more favorable rate and sometimes they're not taxed at all. Um, so that timing and the way that you receive the income or distributions uh, matters quite a bit, which you know kind of leads me to that uh, the second um, I guess, culprit that I want to bring up, you know, we talked about higher interest and those interest payments on the savings accounts and money market accounts. You know, when you look at your other investments, you know, such as mutual funds, there's these uh, things called capital gains distributions. You ran into those ones yet, Walt? Yeah, yeah. Those are, those are, <laughs> aren't any fun, right? <laughs> N- no, not, not at all. So if, for any listeners that, um, you know, have investments that are outside of your retirement accounts, so outside of Roth accounts, outside of uh, IRA accounts, and they're just in a t- what's called a taxable brokerage account. You know, this allows you to actually, you know, pick and choose different investments. Sometimes those investments can be a CD. Those investments can be a stock. They can be mutual funds. Um, there's a whole host of things that you can invest in in these taxable brokerage accounts. For a number of years, one of the popular things uh, that were held were mutual funds. You know, simply put, a mutual fund is just a place where you hand a company your money and then they go and invest it for you. And there are thousands of these mutual funds out there 
um, that have different objectives and goals and so on and so forth. I've had a lot of listeners run into mutual funds, mostly through like their retirement plans uh, that they have through work, uh, because mutual funds are the biggest investment option that are available inside of those. But these mutual funds, when they're held outside of a retirement account, uh, there can be a little bit of issues. And one of the issues uh, that comes into play uh, in the situation that we're talking about here today is these capital gains distributions. So there's laws in place to where mutual funds have to distribute um, a certain percentage of gains each year inside of their account. So if that mutual fund, let's say, invests in stocks and the stocks are being traded throughout the year, you know, there might be um, a buildup of gains inside of that uh, mutual fund and those have to be paid out. You know, on a typical year, you know, Morningstar, you know, they do a lot of research and analysis on this, but a typical year, you know, they estimate that, you know, between five and 10% of a mutual fund, you know, historically, or at least on average, you know, gets paid out. Uh, but in some cases, they can be much, much higher. You know, you do a quick Google search on capital gains distributions, and there's this doghouse list that, you know, comes up frequently in those uh, searches. And uh, basically, it's a list of mutual funds for the prior year that had higher than 20, sometimes up to th over 30% of uh, their funds value distributed in the form of these capital gains distributions. And the reason why that can be a problem is, is that from your standpoint or an investor standpoint, you can't stop that distribution. Well, so it's coming to you uh, no matter what. And uh, that distribution uh, is going to be taxable to you in the year that it happens. So, you know, individuals and families can get this big surprise, you know, from the mutual funds that they hold because they get these big capital gains distributions that are then taxed to them. And then they've got to handle that when it comes time to file the taxes. Just kind of hits you from all angles, doesn't it? <laughs> it does. I mean, the good news is, is, I mean, there are you know better options out there, and there are things to consider uh, when you are building and constructing your portfolio. You know, one of the easiest things to do as you look at your you know taxable brokerage accounts is to use investment vehicles that limit um, or try to minimize those capital gains distributions. Now, there are some mutual funds out there that do a good job at this, um, but normally a better wrapper uh, is holding instead of the mutual fund is to hold it as an ETF or an exchange traded funds. You know, these are taxed a little bit differently. They have a little bit different rules uh, that they have to follow. And one of the big ones uh, in the case of an ETF is that those capital gains distributions are not nearly they're not written in stone and they don't have to come to you like they do in the form of a mutual fund. So just simply changing that wrapper or the vehicle that you use in those accounts and using ETFs versus mutual funds can be a nice, easy way uh, to help limit those capital gains distributions and then thus, you know, limit some of those surprise tax bills when it comes time to times to file your return. Now, of course, you know, there are some horror stories here. You know, you, I think back to just in 2022, I was meeting with a family last year. You know, I typically ask for, you know, prior year tax returns when I'm going through a family situation. You know, so this uh, case was no different. You know, I was sitting down with them and I was talking them through their, their 2022 tax return. And to kind of paint the picture here a little bit, well, 2022 was not the best year from a performance standpoint. Um, I was very happy to put it in the rearview mirror. But the, the S&P 500 was down, you know, over 20%. The bond market had a historically bad year. I think the ag bond index was down some somewhere around 15%. So really, there was no place to hide in 2022. And investors seen their accounts, you know, a lot of times, whether you're an aggressive investor or a conservative investor, you know, saw some pretty historic hits at the end of the year when they were looking at their account balances. This family was no different. Um, but when I looked at their return, you know, they had almost $25,000, $30,000 of actual gains that hit their tax return that they had to pay taxes on from those investments that were down. And one of the reasons for that is they were getting capital gains distributions you know, from some of their investments. So what happened you know, in their situation is, is, hey, they went through 2022. Their accounts were all down because of the poor performance from a stock and bond standpoint. But yet then they had this kind of double whammy when it came time for taxes because then those investments actually kicked off some gains that they had to pay taxes on. You know, that increased their tax bill almost four grand that year. So while well, they were in a situation where they lost money, but yet they still had to pay taxes on those investments returns. Oh, that's definitely not a fun surprise to get. A no, 
Not, not at all. Um, and you know, mutual funds wasn't the only you know thing in their portfolio that was doing this. They actually had a, an all stock strategy that they were managing, and the uh, advisor that they were using was buying and selling a lot of stocks um, to maintain the allocations that they thought were appropriate. Well, a lot of times with those strategies and all those different stock sells and buys, you know, that can add up over time um, and create gains that kind of flow through on the return. So. You just need to be mindful of these things as we're kind of building and thinking through the portfolio. You know, we talked about how interest can impact it, capital gains distributions and portfolio income in general can impact it as well. So we want to be mindful of both, especially when we're looking at and trying to you know construct that portfolio outside of our retirement accounts when those taxes become you know very substantial and significant and sometimes you know give us those big surprises when we go to file. Now that's it from a portfolio construction standpoint. But sometimes, well, we're just flat out under withheld. You know, I think back on those 1099 years uh, that you had mentioned, you know, a lot of the families that I work with that are on 1099, when we first start working with them, you know, they find themselves in a, a very similar situation. And frankly, it's just that they're not withholding enough on the income that they earned. I think that's where a lot of this just comes down to is trying to predict and do that math ahead of time. And right, this is the basics mm -hmm. of getting that as close to zero as you can when you're doing all these calculations. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and too, you got to think about it. You're running a business, you're being a consultant. I mean, there's a lot of things that are on your plate. And and a lot of times, kind of like what we mentioned on the intro, you know, sometimes your CPA, your investment advisor, your financial professional, all these professionals that you have in your life, they're not really communicating as effectively as they should. And there is so much value in having a cohesive unit that are you know helping you make decisions in your best interest. And I see it so much, especially when it comes down to taxes and those withholdings and getting some of that stuff right. You know, even if you're working and you're not a small business owner, or not on a 1099, you know, sometimes you're just under withheld because you maybe a lot of your income comes in the form of bonuses or whatever the case may be. So the fix can be simple. Um, a lot of times we're filling out new, what they call W-4 forms uh, that you can turn into your employer that adjust your tax withholding or, you know, allows you to add a, you know, additional withholding out of each paycheck. You know, so we're looking at that for clients every single year and, and trying to manage, um, you know, what that tax withholding looks like so we don't get in a situation where, you know, there is a pretty substantial bill uh, when it comes to tax times. But we also see it for individuals when they have a major life event or a change. You know, a lot of the families that we work with, you know, come to us when they get serious about retirement. So we work with a lot of retirees. And when you think about that as a life transition, well, you know, hey, a lot of times your income's going away. Sometimes you're starting social security. Sometimes you're starting distributions from retirement accounts. All these things, you know, trickle down and have a tax impact. Um, and understanding how that withholding is going to happen and where it's going to come from is, extremely important. Uh, you know, I think about Social Security, for example, you know, we help a lot of individuals apply for Social Security. And what always surprised me uh, when I was doing all those is there is no place when you apply for Social Security to say you want a certain amount withheld for taxes. I mean, it just boggles my mind. Well, you actually have to go to their website, print off a form and either fax it, mail it in or drop it off to the office. You know, they don't, it's not, they don't make it intuitive to think that, hey, the Social Security potentially could be taxable to me. I might want to withhold some, um, do some withholding. You know, it's not part of the process and something that you need to do separately outside of uh, the normal application, mm. which always just rubbed me the wrong way. Yeah. Yeah. We want to try and, I mean, the, the goal for you is to make life a little easier. That's not always the goal of other entities, right? <laughs> sure. No, absolutely. And there is a multitude of ways that you can get those tax payments done. You know, in the case of Social Security, they have what's called a W-4V form, uh, you know, that you can fill out and, you know, have some federal tax withholding done. Um, certainly, you can withhold it on retirement plan distributions. You know, so, you know, some families we work with are living off of like a monthly distribution from their retirement accounts. And then, you know, just like while you were working, uh, when you were making a paycheck and you were withholding uh, off the top and sending some to the IRS, you know, same case applies here. When you start pulling money out of your retirement accounts, you can withhold taxes off the top and go ahead and send it to, you know, federal and state governments to make sure that that tax bill gets paid. And then when it comes time for tax, uh, time to file your taxes and you get what's called a 1099, then that document will say, hey, you withdrew this much, but you went ahead and 
hold and paid this much in taxes for federal and state, just like you do on a traditional W-2. You know, of course, we have some individuals that are making estimated tax payments as well. These are estimated quarterly tax payments where you can just, you know, go on the IRS's website or your state's website and complete those payments online or actually mail in a check every quarter. So, you know, there are more than a handful of ways for you to get the appropriate tax withholding. But I think the biggest thing to remember is, well, hey, did you have a life event? Did you have a income change or something substantial that would trickle down to your taxes? And do you need to rethink and, you know, adjust some of that withholding that you're you're doing? Now, um, a lot of times, it's not just the pain of having that tax bill, but sometimes the good old IRS will hit you with penalties too if you don't withhold enough throughout the year. So at the end of the day, we don't want to be paying anything in penalties. Um, you know, there are some safe harbor rules that are in place, well, to make it a little bit easier uh, that they use to test to determine, you know, if you have a penalty or not uh, for under withholding. Um, you know, a lot of times if you file your tax return and you have less, uh, it shows less than $1,000, you know, then you're not going to get penalized on that. Or if you paid in, at least 90% of the taxes shown on your return for the taxable year or 100% of the taxes shown on the return for your prior year, whichever amount is less. So you know, those are a couple rules that you can use to kind of say, hey, did I withhold enough and do I might have a penalty coming up? Of course, you know, they like to make things as complicated as possible. So there is a slightly altered rule for high income earners. So if your adjusted gross income is above 150, 150,000. Uh, if you file separately, if your income's above 75,000, then you actually got to pay the lower of 90% of the taxes shown on your current year return or 110% of the taxes shown on the previous year. So, you know, there are a few other um, special rules that come into play, um, but those are, uh, I guess, a baseline that you can kind of use to judge and say, hey, you know, we want to avoid those penalties. Let's keep ourselves out of that and uh, make sure that we pay it enough throughout the year. That's great. Great points all across the board there, Tyler. So um, good advice overall here. Is there kind of a, a neat way we can wrap a bow around this conversation for those who are maybe still trying to get their taxes done for this year, things to be thinking about? Or is this really like a let's start thinking about 2024 taxes for, for next year and making sure that we're paying enough each quarter? And is this something that you guys help clients determine and, and figure out this this whole tax piece? Sure. You know, I think it's um, absolutely something that's probably a 2024 endeavor and kind of um, preparing for the upcoming year as a, as in everything that we do. And, you know, on every podcast, I feel like I, I say the same things, but having some type of plan in place and having a strategy, you know, when you head into the upcoming year, um, you know, that's extremely important. And that's how you alleviate some of these surprises when they come up. And, if you don't have somebody looking at this for you um, or your investment professional and your CPA is not communicating um, in regards to this portfolio income that's hitting, you know, you're really missing out. So I think um, just with anything, taking a more holistic approach, um, and integrating your investment and income strategies together to provide better outcomes at tax time is, is really the approach um, to take. And of course, um, you know, that's the approach that we take here at True Wealth Design and we feel like that's the route to go. So if you don't have somebody looking at, at it for you, or if you don't feel like there's adequate communication between the professionals that you're working with, you know, we'd be happy to, to have a conversation and talk to you a little bit about how we do it here at True Wealth Design and you know, how we can kind of set you up for you know, 2024 taxes. Very good. Well, here's how you have that conversation with Tyler and the great team at True Wealth Design. Just give them a call at 855-TWD-PLAN, 855-TWD-PLAN, or you can go to truewealthdesign.com, which we have linked in the show description today, and you can click on the Are We Right For You button and schedule a 15-minute call with an experienced advisor on the team. Again, just go to truewealthdesign.com and click the Are We Right For You button, and you can make sure you get these taxes all straightened out and uh, ready for next year. Go ahead and start thinking in advance. And while you're at it, not only thinking about the tax piece of this conversation, but all the other elements of financial and retirement planning, Tyler and the team are going to help you make sure that you're well set up there as well. So all you have to do is go to truewealthdesign.com and book your 15-minute call today to get started. Tyler, thanks for all the great guidance and advice on the show today. Enjoyed it, and uh, I won't say it was a fun trip down memory lane back to those days <laughs> when I used to get those those bigger bills, but uh, <laughs> yeah, at least reminds enough. me I, of why I got on track, right? I was going to say, now, now it just reminds you of being on track and how hopeful it is. So right. happy to be here. Yeah, I had a lot of fun, and I'll see you on the next one. Yeah, when, when, when you see the threat of that penalty coming up, you, you, you get straight real fast. So sure. <laughs> that definitely helps keep you in line. Well, for Tyler, I'm Walter. Thanks for joining us. We will talk to you next time on Retire Smart.
Information provided is for informational purposes only and does not constitute investment, tax, or legal advice. Information is obtained from sources that are deemed to be reliable, but their accurateness and completeness cannot be guaranteed. All performance reference is historical and not an indication of future results. Benchmark indices are hypothetical and do not include any investment fees.